Okay, everybody. Chapter 9. Is their life on Mars? It's got really, really exciting in the story now. Jazz and Elijah are trapped in the back of the Mars buggy and someone is coming. I wonder what's going to happen next. Sol, 115. Mars, year 57. Late at night. Diary, this is Jazz. So much has happened since Elijah stopped writing. I don't even know where to start. We were playing at being arrested by alien police in Marstropolis when suddenly the door to the hangar opened and the sunlight glared inside. There, in the doorway, stood three figures with horrible blue skin and enormous heads. Elijah was babbling away in the luggage compartment about whether Martians would have the same laws as humans. I hissed at him to be quiet. His head popped up from the back. When he saw the figures, he started to breathe very quickly. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, he gabbled. We're going to be caught. We are going to be in so much trouble. They are going to arrest us. They are going to throw us off the planet. I haven't even seen Olympus Mons yet. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. I shushed him. Shh, shh. We tried not to move too much. We didn't want to be spotted. Then the figures huddled, huddled together and I took my chance to leap into the back with Elijah. He was shivering. Don't worry, I said, rubbing him on the back to calm him down. It's just my mum and some of her scientist buddies. They are much too busy to notice that we are even here. Today's the day mum's going to look for aliens. Elijah's eyes went wide with panic. He had worked out my plan. I hadn't told Elijah everything, but I didn't exactly lie. I told him that we weren't going to drive the buggy, and that was true. Mum was the driver. Elijah is very sensible, you see. Sometimes he's too sensible. I knew that the only way to get him into the Mars buggy was to convince him that it was just pretend. However, it wasn't pretend at all. Today was the day that Mum was setting off to find aliens, and we were going with her. The buggy door opened, and one of the rubbery blue people swung themselves inside. I could tell by the familiar way in which she moved that she was my mum. She began to press buttons on the keypad inside the craft. We've checked the buddy buggy over. She's in perfect health, said one of the blue-suited people outside. Their voices fizzed through our spe uh, helmet speakers as they came within range of us, and I clamped my mouth shut so that they wouldn't know where we, uh, we were there. It's a short trip, said the other, but we'll be on the end of the line if you need us. I just hope that I can remember how to drive, Mum joked, strapping herself in. The door slammed shut and the buggy engine hummed into life. This was it, our last chance to own up and go back inside the colony inside where everything would be safe and normal and boring. Letitia's smug face swam in my mind. I kept my mouth shut. If we confessed now, we'd be put on the first rocket back to Earth. This was our only chance to prove that we were real explorers, just like Gran. Excitement and nerves bubbled like lava in my stomach. That's a great line, isn't it? Excitement and nerves bubbled like lava in my stomach. The, the large door in front of the hangar rolled open. Official-sounding vo official voices crackled over the radio again. Fuel tank, full. Weather conditions, blustery. Risk of dust storm, 5%. Mum's flicking switches and twiddling knobs. The hum of the engine turned into a steady chug. With a grumble and a lurch, the buggy was off, out into the hangar, into the cold Mars sunlight. Elijah's hand gripped mine. I squeezed his fingers through our thick space gloves to reassure him. We drove for ages. Elijah and I couldn't see much because we were crouched in the back behind the shutter. We could only see a slice of the dashboard and a, sh and a sliver of the windscreen. At first, it was interesting to watch Mars, the Mars soil roll past, but after a while, it got very boring. Dusty orange rocks were scattered in every direction. Even the air tram ride to Grand's flat was more interesting. At least there were trees and buildings and people to look at as they flew past. 
The journey seemed to take hours and hours, and that's because it did. I couldn't see the clock on Mum's dashboard. When we set up, it said 11.31. And when it, we arrived, it said 13.45. The whole time she was take, talking back and forth with her team at the colony, their voices were crackly and hard to make out, but Mum kept giving updates about where we were. 13 kilometres northeast of Marineris and skirting some craters. In five kilometres, I'll have a clear route ahead of me. 19 kilometres north northeast, and approaching a steep ridge. I've still got three quarters of a tank, so I'm going to give it some welly. We'd only travelled a few kilometres, and it took forever because the buggy had to go slowly over the uneven terrain. At last, we arrived somewhere gloomy and quiet. Mum stopped the buggy with a jerk. I've reached my destination 32 kilometres from base. I'm about to descend into the cave and collect the sample. I should report back within three hours. Over. Copy, said the distorted voice over the radio. There was a beep and then silence. The buggy gave a deep rumble and began to gently shake. Elijah and I held out our arms and tried to stabilise ourselves as the buggy began to judder. That's when I realised that it was lowering us down into a cave. After a few mo moments, the buggy steadied itself and came to a stop. Mum unclipped herself from her seat and made her way to the door. With a clunk, the buggy's door swung up and Mum leapt out, with her steady breath fading away as she walked away from us. Sorry, her steady breathing fading away as she walked away from us. And I knew it was safe to talk. Okay, wow. I shook Elijah's arm. This is our chance. We have to follow mum so that we can help her capture alien life. We can't let her face them alone. We scurried from the buggy, our boots thudding on the dusty ground. The buggy was parked inside a cave, nothing like the caves on Earth. It was more like a crater as the sunlight streamed in from the large hole above our heads. The floor was made of rubbly red soil and the walls were rough. Jagged tooth shapes hung from the roof. Look, Elijah whispered, that means there must have been lava here once. Shh, I said at uh, once. What if the aliens hear us? Or even worse, Mum! In one hand, Mum was holding a strange piece of equipment with a long metal rod and a small display. And in the other, she held a torch, a trowel and a jar hung from her belt. We waited until Mum was nearly out of sight before we crept after her. Every so often, she stopped, she stopped and plunged the metal rod into the ground. Each time, we froze, hardly daring to breathe until she started moving again. I wondered if the metal rod was some kind of Martian sensor. Mum went deeper and deeper into the cave until everything was completely black. It was eerily quiet inside my helmet. I gripped my screwdriver and strained my ears pointlessly. Sound doesn't travel far in the atmosphere here, and all I could hear was Elijah's panicked breathing. But what if aliens had super hearing? Perhaps Martians could see in the dark, and that's why they didn't mind living in caves. Perhaps we were at the entrance of an underground city. Mum didn't seem to be car carrying tranquilizer darts or a net. I wasn't sure how she was going to collect an alien with just a torch and a trowel. We followed Mum for hours, although I didn't have a clock or watch. I felt sure that we had been outside of the buggy for longer than we had been travelling in it. Mum didn't turn back once. She was lost in her work. Her torch beam shone on the cave walls, which glowed deep crimson. In her wake, I inspected them for alien symbols and the floor for three-toed footprints or slithering tracks. I was so busy looking round at the cave for signs of alien life that at first I didn't notice how strangely Mum was acting. She was stumbling over her own footsteps and she bounced off one cave wall and onto the other. She was shaking violently. Then she fell forward onto her knees. I tried to race over to her to see if she was okay, but Elijah grabbed my arm as we watched. We saw what she was doing. She was scraping at the ground with her trowel. She poured a trickle of red dust into the jar at her waist and was just sealing it up when she slumped to the side against the cave wall. What's happening? asked Elijah. 
I didn't wait to find out. Mum! I yelled, and I ran to where she lay. I shook her shoulder. Oh, have you come to rescue me, she said, in a low, woozy voice. It's very warm. I didn't know that Mars was so warm. I'm going to take off my spacesuit. With that, she reached up to unclip her helmet. No! I yelled, and I grabbed her hands. You'll die if you do that. Mars is too cold, and there's not enough oxygen. Elijah, help. Luckily, Mum isn't very big, even for a grown-up. Elijah took her feet and I took her shoulders and we carried her from the cave. Mum had gone all floppy and was still babbling. The way in which he was behaving reminded me of something. It, it took an age to get Mum back to the buggy and we puffed and panted the whole way. We opened up the back and loaded her inside. By then she had stopped shivering. Suddenly I remembered, Hypothermia! I cried. That thing that you get when you get really cold, I explained. He, explained uh, he said that it was hypothermia, and I explained what Gran had told me. It means that she's too cold. It did, I didn't say that if we weren't quick, she could die. I didn't even want to think about that. We need to warm her up, but not too quickly. Grab my bag. It's full of socks. What about the silver poncho, said Elijah, flinging my bag over. If we turn the ponchos inside out, her body heat will be reflected back at her so that she warms up instead of getting colder and colder. Perfect, I shouted. Wrap her middle first. That way, she warms from the inside out. We should get the engine running too. The, scre the screen showed that the buggy's temperature had dropped to minus four, but Elijah and I couldn't feel it. Elijah said that the heat of the engine should warm up the buggy. He explained that Mum's spacesuit heating regulator system must have broken or she wouldn't have got so cold. He inspected the wires in, uh, on the front and he found the tiniest split in one of the wire cases. They're meant to be checked and double checked before every mission. Mr. Moustache said so. As I remember it, I remember a huge twinge of guilt, how, I, uh, how fed up I'd been checking three of those suits. If I'm ever on wire checking duty in the future, I'll be extra careful, even if it's the most boring job in the world. But there was no time to dwell on that. Mum needed help now. Let's go, I said, pushing Elijah towards the pilot seat. Elijah's face went all wobbly and his eyes went so wide that I could see how white they were, even through the dark glass of his helmet. Me? But I'm rubbish at galaxy races. It's true, Jazz, uh, sorry, it's true, Elijah is completely rubbish at galaxy races. Jazz? Mum's weak voice cracked over the rubble of the buggy's engine. Jazz, it's time for bed now, darling. There was no time to lose. Mum was still in danger and I needed to get her to safety. I'll pilot the buggy back to the marineris colony. Just keep Mum warm and don't let her go to sleep, whatever you do. She, uh, we want to keep her conscious so that we can tell her... We can tell if she is warming up. I leapt into the pilot seat. Elijah had already started up the engine, so that all I had to do was to get the buggy moving. I pressed the button after I pressed button after button, but nothing seemed to happen. I had to get this thing moving, or Mum was going to be in even more trouble. After trying a few more buttons, I realized that there was a pedal on the floor. This had to work. Pressing the pedal lightly with the very tip of my toes, I held my breath as the buggy began to move forwards. Slowly, we rumbled over the rocky ground. I experimented with the steering wheel, jerking it this way and that. Then I revved the engine and we shot up out of the cage and over the rocky landscape, following the buggy tracks in the dust. Oh my goodness, what a chapter. Look at the pictures there. There's Jazz and Elijah following Mum into the cave. Then they realise that Mum's uh, space suit is broken. There's a crack in one of the wires. And she's getting colder and colder. It's hypothermia. She wants to take off her helmet, but she can't. If she takes off her helmet, she's going to die. So they, they've started to warm her up. In, they've taken her back to the buggy, and they're warming her up in the buggy. But they remember what Gran said about hypothermia. You can't warm up your legs and arms. You have to warm from your middle, from your tummy and your middle outwards, all the way to your fingers. You have to start being warm in your middle first, and then you get warm in your fingers. 
and now Jazz is the one because she was the best at Galaxy Racers on the on the on the spaceship. She's the one who's got to drive the buggy back to the colony. Tomorrow is the last chapter of the story. I'm super excited to read it to you tomorrow. I wonder what is going to happen. Check out the next video as well for the activity that's coming up.